Hello, everyone. Welcome to Arc Studio Presents. I'm Micah Craddy, a screenwriter and the head of writing at Arc Studio, uh, which is the great screenwriting app you just saw in that video that had that absolutely fantastic royalty free music uh, that I found on the internet earlier today and uh, was blasting uh, too loud. Uh, but you can check out Arc Studio at arcstudiopro.com. Uh, and we're going to post a discount link in the chat for $30 off a year of Arc Studio Pro as a thank you for showing up tonight. So in just a moment, I'm going to bring Tom Schnauz on stage, and we're going to be talking about Breaking Story. Really excited about it. Uh, but first, a quick announcement, as I see people are still joining and everyone's getting settled in. We have another great live Q&A uh, next week, Wednesday the 13th at 5 p.m. Pacific, with the screenwriting duo from Ant-Man and the Wasp, Andrew Barr and Gabriel Ferrari. And we're gonna be talking about their writing process and how Marvel movies get written. So that should be really awesome. Uh, we're also gonna put an RSVP link to that event in the chat. Again, that's gonna be on Wednesday at 5 p.m. Uh, Pacific. If you're watching on YouTube, please click subscribe, uh, turn on notifications if you wanna know about future events. We're gonna be doing a lot of the stuff moving forward. Um, but without further ado, I'm gonna bring onto the stage the man, the myth, the legend, uh, Tom Schnauz. Sorry, uh, that's just a little little uh, uh, a cheer, a little applause to, to get you started with. Need that sound to greet me everywhere I go now. Uh, we could follow you around probably. I bet there's an app for that. Um, Tom, thank you thank you so much for joining us. How, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing good. How you been? Yeah, I've been good. Been busy. Uh, been excited for this event. Um, get, getting questions from people. People are very excited to talk about Breaking Story. Uh, I see you're in your office. Uh, you want a show right now? Uh, I am working on a show called Gen V, which is aired on Amazon, uh, season one. I did not work on season one. I'm currently helping them with season two. Awesome. Uh, which is a breaking story, and they start shooting uh, not too long up in up in Canada now. They're going to uh, production starts in probably two or three weeks. Cool. That's the the boys spinoff, right? Where they're like in college. Yeah. So superheroes. This is superheroes in college. Um. Cool. I kind of want to talk to you. So the big thing is we're going to talk about breaking story and primarily how that has uh, worked on, you know, the show that's in the posters behind you, Better Call Saul, The X-Files. But I also kind of want to talk about different ways, you know, on other shows you've worked on that aren't in the uh, sort of the Vince Gilligan type style uh, uh, shows. Yeah. But um before we get into the whole thing and talking about like index cards and cork boards, which you guys have kind of become famous for, uh, I want to start hearing a little bit about how your career started. Um, you worked on the X-Files and the spinoff of the X-Files, The Lone Gunman. Uh, how did you get started on those jobs? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I went to NYU Film School um, and uh, spent a lot of years writing screenplays until I finally had one optioned. I've never had a screenplay made, but I've had things optioned, uh, which sort of started my full-time writing career. I joined the Guild back in 1994 um, and then was living in New York, uh, ran out of money, could not support myself as a screenwriter. Uh, so I knew Vince Gilligan from NYU. We had gone there together and I called him up asking him, you know, I'm thinking of moving to LA to try television. Screenwriting's not sustaining me. I need to take other jobs. And I just happened to call him when they were starting the X-Files spin off The Lone Gunman, and he said, you know the show, you know the characters, come up with some pitches and come out, fly out to Los Angeles, come pitch to Frank Spotnitz and John Scheiben and myself some ideas and see what happens. And I came up with like a list of like 30 ideas, whittled it down to six that I pitched to them. They liked one enough to have me write it, on, write it not as part of the staff, but I wrote it. They liked it enough that they hired me on the show and then when the Lone Gunman got canceled, they liked me enough to put me on the X-Files. And that got me into television. <laughs> uh, thank God. But was like a month was the, the one you wrote um, on spec, did you sell that? Uh, was that a produced show or was it just a sample? Yeah, no, they, they made it. No, they, we, they, I pitched it. I wrote it. Um, and yeah, it got made. It was, it was incredible. I couldn't believe I was sitting in Brooklyn and they sent me a VHS copy of auditions. Uh, 
David Tobolowsky, who they eventually cast in my episode, was one of the people who auditioned. I could not believe how fast, because with screenwriting, you know, the six years I'd been doing screenwriting and getting producers to say, oh, I love it, blah, 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 nothing happening. I wrote this script, and all of a sudden, my God, I'm getting audition tapes. It was the first time actors, I heard actors read what I had written uh, yeah. outside of Tom, I hate to interrupt you, but I think your is your uh, computer fan might have been going off or something there. Oh, it was, it's there. I don't know if the static. If other people are, are hearing that. Yeah, the sound. Okay, sorry about that. No worries. Okay, you're only talking about one of the most wonderful moments of your career. <laughs> it's just perfect to like be like. Uh, How's that? Does it sound better? Yeah, that sounds great. All right, cool. All right, so you're talking about the, like the difference of going from uh, in screenwriting where you're just like, I feel like this is a strange thing, right? Where there are people who can maybe even have their whole careers, they're optioning things, but like nothing's ever getting made and going from that to like TV world where just things are happening so quickly. Oh yeah, it happened so fast. I mean, I could not believe, I mean, the, pro the from when I had written the, the Lone Gunman script to when I was actually seeing dailies for the episode was incredible. It was incredibly fast after years of getting notes on screenplays and having nothing happening. And just like, am I ever gonna get anything made? Um, yeah, it was great. Just the yeah. speed of it. Which is like a feeling that every screenwriter has felt deep in their 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 soul at some point. Um, I got a great question here. Uh, do you remember your first writer's room? So when you were on The Lone Gunman and then The X-Files, uh, what were the takeaways from, what did you learn in those early rooms that have, you know, stuck with you and served you throughout your career? Yeah, I mean, early on, I it was listening to the voice of the showrunner, because a lot of times the showrunner will sit there as you're breaking an episode, they'll pitch dialogue and just sort of pitch um, in the voices of different characters. And I remember listening very closely to how things were pitched and how they spoke in the characters' voices and, and carrying that onto the page and uh, getting a better response when I was sort of mirroring what was being pitched in the room as opposed to uh, trying to reinvent something. So it was just listening to the voice of your, of your showrunner and uh, putting that on the page. You mentioned um, writing for the characters too. There's another question here I think that's relevant um, because prior to this, you had been working on your own screenplays with characters who only existed in your mind. And now you're coming into a world with Lone Gun and the X-Files where these characters were already existing, uh, was it a hard process that changed or did, did your writing change at all when you are now writing for existing uh, actors? Yeah, I think, I mean, you spend a lot of time watching, so certainly coming into the show like the X-Files, which had been on the air for forever. And you watch the episodes and, and learn the rhythms and, and listening to characters. I mean, even on uh, Breaking Bad coming into that, I, I came in season three watching the, all those episodes and learning how the characters speak and getting Jesse Pinkman's voice and Walt's voice and just just hearing, you know, just listening to the different rhythms that all the different actors had. You wanna definitely tap into to what exists and what those guys are doing ahead of time. Did you do anything formal to tap into those voices? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming you'd watch the shows, but did you like binge them or anything before uh, writing to sort of get their their voices in your head? I mean, not. In t I mean, I binged uh, when I came on to Breaking Bad. Uh, I binged season two. Uh, I got all the DVDs for those because it had not fully aired yet. I think they they had only aired up to episode four of season two when I got the job for season three. Um, so yeah, I, I got all the discs and I watched them like in a, a week before joint. You know, the room started. So I just. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, back in the the DVD days, the the right. heyday of uh, of the industry when people were still making money uh, before streaming uh, changed the world. I still have my hard copies. I still buy. I still buy physical media. Damn it. I mean, that's. I mean, that's crazy. With all the shows being pulled off the streamers, um, like the comeback of physical media, like it's so smart. Like I yeah. just sort of depend on getting the. Uh, um, the, the screeners you get when you're in the industry for the award season, they'll send you DVDs in the mail sometimes. So those are kind of the DVDs that I, I the only ones that I have now are just the free ones that I get. Um, but I think that, you know, sort of the physical media, that's actually a good segue to a question of 
what have been the biggest changes in sort of the TV writing landscape since you started? I mean, obviously one of those is sort of the end of the DVD era and moving into the, the streaming era. I mean, the biggest one is the amount of episodes because I sort of got in at the tail end of, oh, we're doing 24 episodes in a season. I, I, I lived it. I was there for it. I cannot remember for the life of me, remember how it was done. Now the thought of doing eight episodes is exhausting <laughs> to me because I'm just old now. Back in the day, I was like, yeah, we're doing 24 episodes, guys. Let's do it. Roll up your sleeves. We're going to work weekends. We're going to work, you know, insane hours. And we're just going to get the problem with that is that you not every episode. The beauty of Breaking Bad is that, you know, 13 episodes or, or eight episodes, um, you really got to work hard about making every episode as good as we could be. Whereas in a 24 episode season, you're just going to have some stinkers. It's just it's impossible <laughs> to keep up that kind of quality of work across the board. I mean, the actors get exhausted, the crew gets exhausted. Mm -hmm. I remember walking on the X File stages and just poor crew members just asleep on on set. You know, just be. I mean, it was it was hard, hard work, and it was. Thank God things have changed because people would get hurt, and and you know. You don't want that. When you, were, when you were making those episodes that were stinkers, like, did did you guys know that in the room? Was there just like the sense like this is not going to be a good one? I don't think. No, I think I don't know if you know that. I mean, I don't know if you you try you you try your best on every one, and then just time runs out, and you you just like we we have a a date, we have to meet a mark. Whereas I think on the on on Breaking Bad and, and Saul, you we would go forward and we plot, we'd probably get seven or eight episodes in a, you know, broken uh, before shooting would, we'd even think about shooting. And that way, if something felt wrong, we could go back and change it and make things right. Whereas in a, a regular TV production schedule, you write it, it's, it's off to the races. They're, they're producing it, they're making it, they're shooting it. And you're, you're only an episode or two ahead of, of what they're mm -hmm. shooting and it's more chaotic. So you're just trying your best just to stay ahead and not shut, shut down <laughs> production and lose a ton of money for the studio. Um, was X-Files, where did they film it? At the Fox lot. Uh, yeah. I was, they, they moved from Vancouver, I think episode uh, season six, season six, they moved down to uh, Los Angeles and they filmed it in the Fox lot. That's such a different vibe because the fir very first shows I was a PA on were uh, sitcoms on the Fox lot. And it's so different, you know, so Breaking Bad, Better Call Saul filmed in New Mexico. The writers are in LA. There's that physical separation. There's a very, I feel like there's a very different energy when you're like walking down the stairs and suddenly you're on set, you know, when it's yeah. filmed in LA versus somewhere else. Um, yeah, no, was uh, occasionally they, you know, send, I was one of the newer writers. They send me over to set just to see what was going on just to have a writer on set um to answer any questions or, or help what was going on so it was, it was cool that it was close by but it, there's also something great about having it be a separate like not so close and uh you know you you go there and stay overnight you get a hotel and you're you're there you're sort of immersed in it uh as opposed to being able to jump back and forth between the writer's room and the although it, we did a couple of times bring the writer's room to New Mexico uh, just to just to catch up because we were always falling, you know, not always falling behind, but when we did, we kind of uh, get all hands on deck and get everybody there. Yeah, I remember on Better Call Saul uh, when on season one, when I was the script coordinator, which is where Tom and I met, that I was like the one holding down the the L.A. office. <laughs> the entire room went to New Mexico. Right, right because right we all yeah. went out for the shooting of episode one. Right. Uh, so we weren't really in trouble then. We were just like, let's get all the writers out there because Vince was directing and Peter wanted to be there, but we didn't want to slow down the breaking process. So everybody went out and stayed at the Homewood Suites <laughs> and uh, uh, filming and, and uh, which really helped inform those last uh, three episodes or four episodes, seven, seven through Frozen a little bit, I think. Hopefully, Tom uh, comes back in a second. 
uh tom if you can hear <laughs> you're uh you're frozen in a in a very flattering pose though so don't worry um about that um the joys of the internet which has made everything easier for everyone up until um it stops working and i conduct an interview with a still image um maybe a good time to mention again <laughs> our event next week uh with uh, the um Ant-Man and the Wasp writers, which would be really fun. Um, we lost Tom. I think he's going to rejoin in a second when his internet um, comes back. We're also doing this event. It's called uh, Write With Us, which are pretty cool. We're doing it on a Wednesdays at 1 p.m. where we do uh, live uh, writing, um, uh, like write sprints together. So I'll be on here. We'll put on uh, timers and uh, do a 15-minute writing sprint and then a 25-minute a writing sprint and a 30-minute writing sprint. It's just like a thing that's nice um, in the middle of the week to like build some writing time into your schedule uh, and just uh, focus um, on the writing. And I think I can probably find a link to that and uh, add it to the chat because uh, we're still waiting for Tom to come back. Uh, so I'm sorry, you're just stuck with me uh, for a minute. Uh, how are you all doing? Where are you guys watching from? I think yeah, we can do some audience interaction as well. Um, often we've had people from all over the world, which is pretty cool um, to see them uh, on on here. We have people in like New Zealand and South Africa and the, and all over. Uh, yeah, so sound off in the in the chat uh, where you uh, where you're watching from. Uh, Chattanooga, Atlanta, uh, everything. Uh, Micah, talk about Lodge 49 while we have a break. Sure. So I wrote on a show called Lodge 49, um, which was a, a fantastic show uh, that was also on AMC. I worked on uh, the first season of Better Call Saul, and then I worked on Lodge 49, um, which I think is on AMC Plus, um, which is uh, was like a really fantastic show. And that was the show that I got uh, my first writing job on. I, were, I was a, the script coordinator and writer's assistant on it on the first season. And... Um, it was great. I got to pitch a lot of stories and everything in that uh, season. You know, when you're a writer's assistant, you sit at the table and you're with the staff writers. And it kind of depends on the room. In some rooms, uh, the writer's assistant don't talk much. It kind of depends on what the showrunner wants. Uh, but in that one, I was able to like pitch a lot of ideas and kind of um, prove myself, uh, which was pretty cool. And uh, eventually, I then got to... Uh, a uh all right tom says they're resetting the wi-fi at the office so he's gonna be back soon uh don't worry i'm gonna keep talking until he comes back um but yeah so i got to pitch a lot of ideas and it was really cool i remember there was one day uh in season one of lodge 49 where uh, i don't remember exactly what the pitch was but um it sounds like a really good pitch in the uh, in the room, um, and at the end of the day, the showrunner Peter Ako kind of called me into his office, and he said that was a really good pitch, and kind of um, said, you know, I was doing well, and that you know there were perhaps good things in store for me, uh, and uh, then I got staffed on season two, um, which was fantastic. I'm putting the chat the link in here for the write with us on Wednesday, uh, if you want to come and uh, do some writing sprints. It's it's actually really cool. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 focused writing time for you. Uh, but yeah, but then of course, unfortunately, Lodge Forty Nine um, got canceled. Um, yeah, uh, favorite idea I pitched that made it to screen. Oh, I'm trying to remember off the the top of my head. Uh, there's a couple of scenes in in season two that I really liked. Um, there's one where uh, Dud, who's one of the main characters, he's like a, has a pool cleaning business, but he. Um, his car keeps breaking down. And so I pitched that he has to take all of his pool cleaning uh, equipment on the bus and just like take the the public bus to the the pool. And he's just like carrying all the, and just like bumping into people and everything. Uh, and I really loved that scene. Um, yeah. Um, let's see here. Uh, oh man, I would also love any efforts to revive Lodge 49. I don't think that's gonna happen. Uh, unfortunately, there was a big push, you know, a lot of people loved it. A lot of people were behind the scenes, but Lodge 49 was one of those shows that had like, I, you put it in the small, but passionate fan base, um, following. Um, yeah. So that was, uh, you know, that was pretty, uh, pretty great. Um, my genre of choice as a writer, um, is I love, I mean, I love dark comedies. You know, I started out as a comedy writer more on the, I was assistant on um, sitcoms and stuff. And then I went, uh, I 
had the the, jam, the chance to work on Better Call Saul because um, my boss's um, uh, former assistant was now Vince Gilligan's assistant on Better Call Saul, and they were hiring assistants for that show. And that kind of got me in the AMC world and more in the drama world. So I kind of live in the drama, uh, dark comedy world. Uh, that's pretty um, fantastic. Um, yeah. Um, let's see if there are any other questions out here that are more general, maybe that I can uh, answer while they're resetting the Wi-Fi. Um, all right, what do we got here? Um, a lot of these are, um, oh man, good questions here. Um, this is a good one. What do you do when you get into writer's block? I'd actually actually think, I think this could be a good group participation question. If you have uh, your techniques for getting in a writer's block, um, drop them in the chat. Um, for me personally, I think there's a few different strategies that you can have when you deal with writer's block. I mean, some of it depends on what exactly the, the sources uh, of the writer's block. Oh, Tom is back. Maybe he can share what his, uh, uh, writer's block is Tom. I'm going to add you to the stage back. Tom Schnauz, everyone. He's back. <laughs> it's, you see, uh, here's the problem of doing this from work is that they decided to reset the Wi-Fi, and they bumped me off. Wait, they just they just reset it. They didn't know you were doing a live stream. They were having an issue with it anyway, and they reset it. And then there's no oh, Wi-Fi. So, so writer's block. No worries. I just did 10 minutes of my stand-up routine. No, uh, I was talking a little about Lodge 49 and everything else. Uh, but uh, I'm glad that you're back. And I'm glad people stuck with us. We still got a great audience, everyone. Um, I was answering some questions in the interim, and someone just asked uh, right when you came back about how you deal with writer's block. Uh, before we kind of move on, do you do you want to answer that one? What do you do when you're... You yeah, know? I mean, it's really let your mind free. Find some. You know, I play guitar to just... If I'm stuck do that. I mean, when I write, I don't usually write in order of the, of, of, you know, when we break an episode from the beginning, I will find a scene that I have a, a feel for, whether it's mm -hmm. like in a funny mood or a dramatic mood, I'll find a scene that sort of speaking to me at the moment and I'll start there and I'll write that scene first and then kind of go back and do, do some scenes that I have a feel for. Otherwise it's just, um, if you're stuck on something, find a thing that you love to do, whether it's, you know, Gordon Smith used to do Legos in the room or, you know, again, I had the guitar just, for, you know, you want to be open to play. Mm -hmm. So find something to play with, whether it's a Rubik's cube or, or a jigsaw puzzle or something that sort of gets your mind uh, free where you're thinking you're concentrating. And then suddenly sometimes something snaps in. And a lot of times I will have my best ideas in the shower like I'll go yeah. home, I'll be stuck on a point, and then the next morning I'll I'll wake up and shower. I'll be like, oh, there I I have something. Uh, I don't know why it's the shower, but it's that sort of just cleaning off and. Yeah, I think it's anytime you can, you know, if you if you're aimed directly at a problem, that's where the writer's block. But anytime you can just sort of turn your attention a little bit to something else, the shower, yeah. going on a walk. I love that what you said about play, because I feel like that's so much what we do. Uh, whether in a writer's room or on our own, when we're coming up with stories is just playing. I mean, it's very mm -hmm. similar to, I think of just being a little kid playing cops and robbers or my friend and I would play like lost boys in the wilderness or whatever. And it's like the same thing. We're just coming up with stories and, and, mm -hmm. and, and, a, and a narrative and characters. And so just like kind of tapping into that mindset. But I remember in, um, in Better Call Saul, everyone had their own little things. Yeah, like Gordon was doing those miniatures he was building. Uh, you had your guitar, your electric guitar in your office, and you also had the chess board up. So you could beat right. Tom just kicked my ass in chess. I don't think I ever beat you. I think you beat me every time. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I remember specifically you beat me the very first game we played. Oh, like, really? I'm not going to let that happen again. <laughs> I feel like that's, oh, that's, that's my sweet spot. If you underestimate me, maybe I can beat you. But then once you're actually like paying attention, um, yeah. Um, all right. So I want to get into kind of the heart of the discussion here, which is we're kind of here. This is about breaking story. And I want to go through the whole process of talking about breaking story from the start of a new season. But first, I just want to show a picture. And this is kind of one of the things that you guys have become known for is this thing that we're looking at, Tom, if you can see this right now. So what in general, not specifically this one, but what are we looking at right now? This is a, a, a storyboard 
for an episode that I wrote uh, called Bad Choice Road. And it is the work that all the writers in the writer's room did together, talking about every scene, every beat uh, of the story and distilling it down to a card, just what the scene's about. And we overcarded it. These, these Saul episodes are, are sort of uh, beyond what we did on the X-Files, where the X-Files was very specific, uh, really distilling a scene down. This is we, we suffer from what was called card creep, where things would get a little, uh, we put a little more detail in than we probably should have, but I think it was not a bad thing ultimately, is that the more detail we had as a group, the better the episode was. Yeah, I think um, this is, you posted, these are X-Files cards, so they're just like shorter yes. um, on your Twitter in comparison to, um, if you look at these, yeah, if, if you, I don't know how well you guys can see this on your computers, but there is a lot of cinematic detail in there. And I think that's what you were kind of were talking about, like in terms of overcarding, you were going beyond just the bones of the story. Um, yeah, we we'll talk about opening, sh opening shots, we put dialogue in sometimes, um, still trying to keep it as, uh, pithy as you as we could and just what the scene's about um in shorter beats but i think like act one that's probably three or four scenes uh right there yeah. so or on the x-files it would only be a line of one line of cards this is we have two lines of cards and we probably had to stack some in order to fit all the cards uh on there there, there were a ton of uh directors uh working on uh, Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, including you. You directed a lot of episodes. Do you think this more cinematic carding approach was just a an outgrowth of the fact that there were so many... Because a lot of these are details you'd think more of the director's purview maybe than the writer's purview. Do you think it was because there were so many directors in the room that it was a very cinematic kind of filmmaking room? It's possible that that's the reason. I, I mean, I think we sort of took... Vince's lead because uh, he came from you know, when we did Breaking Bad, he came from the X Files, and I think he started off carding not as detailed, but it just it was just sort of helpful to have everybody in agreement about you know what's the opening shot, what do we want to say, what does this character say, and getting it down in writing so that I mean, the theory was that anybody could take one of these boards, any any of the writers in the writers' room, and go off and write the script. Um, so what you saw there was all all my writing. Uh, I, I think as when Vince left the room, I sort of took over the duty of being the uh, the sharpie wielder, and uh, could, maybe I had the neatest penmanship or whatever. But I, I uh, um, so I, we I, mean, I remember the 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 card writing was just like very important. Like it it was it was almost a ritualized yeah. thing. It was, uh, I mean, the way Frank Spotnitz used to describe it as kind of a zen. It just helped you trying to fit what the scene is about onto a few cards really helped you focus on what is this scene about and is it important that it is in this in this uh, story? Because mm. if it's not, I mean, if it's, if you can't, if it's, if it doesn't have a simple way to describe it and, and why it leads from the previous scene you just wrote then maybe you don't need it and the great thing about having it on cards as opposed to a whiteboard is that oh man maybe that's that beat would be later great later in the episode or maybe we put it early it was very easy to 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 move the puzzle around and see what the episode would look like in a different shape whereas mm -hmm. when we're doing whiteboards which is what we do here at gen v um you sort of have to erase everything and, and rewrite it all and it was um you know everything is time consuming in its own way but just the cards for me is a, are just a better way to figure out what is needed in the story um what is what's where the fat is mm. and what would you say because i you mentioned so basically we're talking about beats of a story and i feel like i don't know there's a lot of chatter people have different definitions of like what a beat actually is it's one of those terms that depending on the screenwriter can mean different things what is your definition of a beat yeah, I mean, I guess it's 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 either a plot moment or an emotional character turn where a character changes from what they previously from you know what made this character go from happy to angry or what's the you know what 
the surprises. What, what are they shocked by? What, are they, what, what didn't they see coming? What are they, what, another thing we were big on is what does a character th- tell themselves that this moment is about as opposed to what it's really about? What's the, the driving, what's the driving force that they don't understand? So we put that in a card is that, you know, Walt, you know, Walt uh, felt the need to, to, to be macho here while he was telling himself he's doing it for his family. I mean, that's a you know, a bad example, but um, we try to put what the subtext is and, and, mm-hmm. and and also what the characters are are telling themselves this is really about. So um, I don't know if that answers the question. But yeah, yeah, yeah. B is a lot of different things. Right. Just... It's a unit of story kind of, right? Like if you add up all the beats, that's your story, I feel like, yeah. is another way um, of looking at it. Um, let's go back to the beginning of a season. Let's say these these cork boards are empty, which is so funny when I was going back to look at the photos for these cork boards because I remembered I actually bought them because I was the script coordinator and the writer's PA. So I think I went to like Office Depot and I just bought, I like you guys, we kept needing more and more boards. So I had to keep buying more boards. <laughs> and we, we, we had a lot of boards. We went to all. Sony to do a pitch and I had to like take the boards in our car, like in my car. And we were walking across the Sony lot and I was so, it was windy and I was so um, terrified the wind was going to blow the cards yeah. away. Oh, well, yeah, the X X files, we had separate bungalows where the producers were, where the writers were, and we'd break our story in our writer's offices and have to carry them, whatever the weather over to the producer's office where Frank's Botnitz was. Yeah. And they'd blow and you'd lose cards. It was yeah, a nightmare, but we had, I was going to say, I love to feel like the idea that there's still some X Files cards like wedged in some crevices or somewhere that like someone might discover today and just be like, yeah. "What is this?" <laughs> oh. But we so, had we had four boards dedicated to episodes. We had two boards dedicated to a season, which is where we would start. That's let's go to that. Let's go to the start. start. The so we had two boards next to each other on one side of the room, and they stayed up the entire season. And we put across the top, we had 10 episodes. We do episode 101 through episode 110. And we just started talking globally, blue skying about what might happen in the season. What would be interesting? Throw some big ideas out there with some emotional ideas. If we want to get Jimmy from here to here, like season one, we probably had written at the end of episode 110, he saw Goodman. Jimmy, you know, we had the idea that Jimmy McGill was going to turn into Saul Goodman by episode 10. So we put a card up to say hmm. Jimmy is Saul Goodman, you know, Jimmy's brother, you know, beats about his brother and just different big ideas. You know, Jimmy gets in a gunfight, whatever the, what do we, yeah. you know, what just fantasize and what's a great big cool thing we'd want to see and just sort of put that stuff up on the board and say, Oh, maybe that would happen around episode one, two, three, whatever. And just sort of lay it up by the end of a season. None of that would match what we did in a season. It was just to get our minds, sort of maybe maybe have a, a loose roadmap of where you want to go. Mm. And we do that for like a month. Just talk about what could happen in the season, what's some cool images. And then Are we you say, thinking okay. at all in that process um, of the season, the, like the arc of the season, are you thinking of it as like a three-act structure or any kind of formal way of like, we need a climb, we need rising action and, and a climax and a you know, falling action? Yeah, we never, we never, took the screenplay format and said that this, I mean, you'd want to build to something. You try to think of what's a dramatic turn and put that near the end of the season and what's a cool twist. And that's the middle of the season. What's a set piece. What's a great set piece, whether it's a gunfight or a fight between the brothers or something and, and find a place for that. And you just kind of feel it out as you're mm-hmm. all talking together, you sort of get a feel of where you want to start. What's uh, what's a hurdle that Jimmy has to overcome here and, and, sort of built to that. Who does he meet? Who does he know? And you'd come up with characters that never saw the light of day in the actual actual show. Um, you know, we had a, uh, you know, this character we called, we named after the actress Mae Whitman. We had this character that we thought for sure was going to be in the show and Jimmy was going to meet and uh, uh, be a, you know, help guide along in, on her path to being a lawyer and and Jimmy was going to corrupt this, this May Whitman character. And it was, but then May Whitman never made it in 
to the show. And that's just something that happens, but it helps you just think about a direction the character can go. And then once you blue sky for a couple of weeks or a month or whatever it is, then you go back to uh, the first episode and mm -hmm. start thinking, where do we want to start? What does our character need to accomplish? What is their, what's in their way to accomplishing this? And, uh, you know, Peter and Vince had a rough outline. Again, a lot of it was not done at all in the show, but they, in this outline, they had a brother, uh, Jimmy had a brother named Chuck, uh, who had a medical condition. And that, that kind of stuck. We all kind of liked that. And, and then we started, we just started at the very beginning. What's the first image we see? Um, and we when built from there. When you're talking about the, the characters there, how do you get into the, um, their, their head spaces? Um, especially because, you know, they're drug manufacturers or, you know, very unique person, you know, circumstances, very unique characters. How do you get in those head spaces? Yeah, you just, you, you, you talk about what they, you know, you, you start from where they are. You think about what has happened before. Uh, if it's, if you're just starting the series, you build a backstory and, and think about what led them to the point that you're starting at and what do they want? Where's their head at? That was always the question we'd ask for every character, where's their head at? What do they want? And then you think about, well, if they want this, then they have to do this. Um, but then another character wants X or Y or Z, and that might be in their way. So how do you, how do these characters overcome the hurdle of one wants it and the other one wants it? And do they Are work together? That on the, the, the character wants, is that on the, the, is that on every level? Is that on the scene level, the episode level, the season level um, of what their goals are, what their hurdles are? Or, it, you know, is there, are you focusing more on the small, like the more short term or the long term end? Ultimately, you, you focus on the short term. You, you have the long term in mind, but I think things change. And once you, if you're focusing on the short term, I mean, the example I give all the time is that in Breaking Bad season five, uh, 5A, um, I think we really thought that Jesse Pinkman was going to become king shit of Albuquerque after uh, some point during the meth-making stages. And But then we the idea happened that uh, Todd, crazy Todd, shoots a kid on a motorbike. And that altered everything. Mm -hmm. Jesse was never going to be a meth dealer after that. He was never going to be you know, he would want to get the fuck out. So that, so folk, you have to focus on the short-term wants of the characters. And that's what we, when we say the characters lead us to what, where the story goes, that's how it happens because you're really just thinking, what do they want next? And what are they telling themselves the reason they want it? And what's the real reason? What are the psychological reasons? What fucked up thing in their background makes them want to be a scam artist or be a be a meth dealer as opposed to taking uh, help from friends, taking financial help from friends. No, oh, I don't want to do that. I'd rather cook meth. What's the, you know, Walt tells himself, I'm doing it for my family. I'm doing, I want to, I'm going to die. I want to leave my family all this money while in reality, the storytellers are thinking, well, he's got some psychological issues of you know, hasn't felt like he's been a man his whole life and he's been oppressed by his, his boss, Bogdan, at the at the, the car wash and he's made to feel like shit. So he's overcoming a lot of things while he's really telling himself, I want to I want to be a hero for my family. And that's not the that's not the reason he does these stupid things. So when you're following all these like short term character moments and choices and like you're veering off the, the path that you've maybe you set, which is exciting. But it's also scary because now you have to figure out the next thing. So there's a question here, which I think is great, which is um, when you uh, do that and you find yourself in a corner, like, how do you get out of that? And like, do you remember any specific, you know, toughest corners you guys wrote yourself into and, and how did you get out of it? Yeah, all the time. And that, I mean, I think if the writing is any good or the storytelling is any good, it's because we were not afraid to get ourselves into a corner because Hopefully, if we, the writers, take several days figuring out how the hell do we get out of this, the person watching at home is not going to think, oh, well, they're going to do 
oh, Walt's going to do this and get out of it. You know, it's because we were like, what the fuck do we do? And Vince would bang his head against the wall or, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever, you know, we, or do we go back? Do we change everything? No, let's stick. Let's figure out how to get, you know, the, the classic one is uh, my first season of Breaking Bad. We had Walt and Jesse in the RV and Hank rolls up and traps them. And we yeah. were like, how the fuck do they get out of this? And right now it seems looking at the episode, it seems simple, but we had no idea. We were like, what we were like, okay, they drill a hole at the bottom of their RV. And there's a, there's a, there's a, a storm drain down there and they go through the storm drain. I mean, we came up with the worst ideas, um, which is key. I'm going to say this now to all the people who are either in writer's rooms or want to be in writer's rooms. You have to have a safe room where the worst ideas are accepted and not made fun of. You have to, that freedom we talk about a play, you have to be able to say the dumbest thing possible because we would, one of our mantras was, oh, maybe the, maybe the bad, here's a, you say, start out, here's a bad pitch. Maybe it'll lead to a good idea. So it's like just getting the thought process out there. And we spent days on how to get Walt and Jesse out of this RV with, and finally, I remember it was finally Peter Gould who was like, oh, I, I Oh, this would be bad. Uh, we have we we have Saul call call Hank and say because what is what does Hank love more than anything in the world? It's his wife, Marie, who would do anything for. Her. And we call Hank up and say something. Your wife's been in a horrible accident, so Francesca pretends to be from the police department or a hospital and saying your wife is in the hospital. There's been a terrible accident, and he had to leave. So that way, I mean, yeah, and now right now it seems like that was a simple, what a simple solution. But we, I mean, we had seven brains in the room, like, what the fuck? What do we do? Oh, my God. Yeah. I I love that what you said about Peter, but like how the prefacing that writers do with, this is probably a bad idea. And I, always, I found that, you know, when I was on Lodge 49, all the pitches that like I really crafted and thought about didn't end up in the show. But whenever I had a pitch, it would be like, all right, I have a crazy idea. Or like, this is kind of dumb, but like, what if this happens? Yeah. Those were like the ones that work because they're, I don't know, there's some sort of like spontaneity to them. Yes. Yeah. And it's not a being afraid. Not, don't be afraid to sound stupid. Um, and it's sort of that that phrase of this is a bad idea. Maybe it'll lead to a good. So like, sort of a self-protection kind yeah. of thing. Just sort of putting that, that armor on of like, Here's a bad idea, guys, but uh, maybe some, and, and very often it does lead to a, a cool idea. Like some, it'll spark something in somebody else and it just kind of goes to the room of somebody will say, we'll build on that bad idea, but make it like not so crazy. Yeah, I mean, I think that's like, I mean, if you've ever done like improv or something, that's like the same thing. It's like building the yes and they'll talk about. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, so many good ideas come from bad ideas. I think that's just like such an important point to underline that if if it's like you need, um, it's like a fire and you need kindling. You just got to like have something to throw in there to burn and eventually it's going to catch. But like it's, it, you got to keep the conversation alive and keep the ideas flowing. Um, yeah. Guys, thanks to everyone who's uh, asking questions. I'm not going to be able to uh, ask all of them. Uh, at the end, I'll try to get through as many as we can. But I think this is a good one. As you're coming up through this um, process, there's all these multiple plot lines, dynamic character relationships. How do you keep track of it all? Yeah, it's really, I mean, it's in the cards. You, um, and it's also, you, you have to have a good memory because <laughs> uh, we didn't really have a ton of characters on the shows. I mean, you think about it, there weren't really so many, like we never saw the parents or the, the families were always very contained. So we, we didn't really juggle a lot of different, multi, you know, multiple plot lines. Uh, I mean, like on Saul, we had Mike's world and we had Jimmy's world, and sometimes they'd cross and sometimes they wouldn't. So, um, you know, very good writers' assistance would would help us keep things on track, especially when it was when we we're doing Saul and we want to make sure that we weren't screwing with anything that was going to happen in the world of Breaking Bad, which was filmed before we filmed Saul. But we want to make sure that. If we're going down this path, will it make sense in a show that we've already shot, which is in the future of our show? Um, so we'd have very good writer's assistance kind of 
write out timelines and help us. And very often we throw an episode up on the computer just to watch and see uh, what was said and, uh, you know, how two characters related with each other or whatever it was, just to make sure. So there was a lot of, and sometimes yeah. we'd make mistakes and somebody would, would review an episode or review a timeline and say, wait a minute, we guys, we screwed up. We got to go back and, and find a different path because this doesn't make sense. Yeah, the, the continuity was so big. I remember um, when I started on Saul, I think the first thing that I did was I was sent all the Breaking Bad scripts and I just read them all so that I would just like, I mean, I'd watch the show, but like to read the scripts to have them, um, which was also just such a fantastic education. You know, it, it, like I feel like it greatly influenced my writing style. Um, so, I mean, that's a plug, by the way, out there. Read as many great scripts as you can and, and read yes. reading bad scripts um, if you can, because they're fantastic. And like the scene writing and crafting um, is is great. Um, let's get back a little bit to the carding process. How does an idea become a card? It's like, how does a bill, it's like Schoolhouse Rock, how does a, a bill become a law? How does an idea uh, become a card? So when we would start an episode, so the thing we did on the on the season board which was lay out some possible things we would do that on an individual board and we'd write up our teaser act one through four and then come up with some ideas about what what's a good starting point what would we like to see what's a good ending point and kind of put those up in possible places of just to give us sort of a direction to go and then we'd go back to the beginning and say okay we're starting here what does the character want where's where's he going and then, then build, and then sometimes those uh, what we call blue cards because we we would write them in blue sharpie as opposed yeah, I think to. I have one. some here right on this here image. You know. Yeah. So well, yeah, what you see there is the later blue cards uh, were part of the original idea board of where we might go. Um, so there used to be blue cards in Act One, but then when we got into the very specific, what are the scenes? That's when the black carding would start. And we'd go through and write it. And I'm um, trying to think, let's see, L Lalo visits Jimmy and Kim. So yeah, that all, that all stayed. There's no real examples of, of things we didn't do, although we did cut out a scene. There's a nacho scene there that we did write and shoot, but then we ultimately, for time, pulled it out. Um, but uh, yeah, you see cool. Mike tells Gus about, uh, you know, a lot of that, a lot of that, so this is an example of a board where things didn't really change drastically from our wish list of things to happen. Um, but there's some there's some gaps in there. And and as you're writing, you get to like what needs to happen, um, what hasn't been, you know, just to make logical sense of to tell the story. What do we need to see? And a lot of things are what you discover are things that you don't need to see. Um, you don't want to have scenes with characters explaining things that we've seen earlier in an episode. So it's figuring out when do we get into the scene? What don't we need to see? Where do we want to end it? Like what's, you always want to find, figure out what's the earliest, uh, what's the latest you can get into the scene? What's the earliest you can get out of a scene as you're, th mm -hmm. as you're talking about a scene. How do you know when something that's been discussed and seems like a good idea is card worthy? That like this, we're going to do this. It just, yeah, that's one of those things. It's just sort of a room feel where everybody, you have a group of writers talking about the scene and sometimes somebody has a problem with it. And don't, I, don't understand, I don't understand why this character would do this mm. or would it be better if the character did this? And then you talk about it, you talk about it. It's like 12 Angry Men, I feel like. It's like <laughs> you want everybody on board and once everybody sort of gets it, they're just like, okay, let's put it on, put it on cards and put it up on the board. And it's, it's very time consuming. And we really had, thanks to Sony and AMC, had a luxury of being able to really spend the time to work out these these plot details. Mm. Um, where a lot of other shows, you're just sort of racing against the clock. And and it's more about, we got to get it done, guys. We got to get, we got to, so what's the story? This makes sense. Okay, let's, where you're not, somebody has a problem with it. Well, the showrunner has to make an executive decision say we're going this way and sorry, we're moving on. I know you have an issue with this, but we got, we got to keep going. We're Vince and Peter. We're very, very much like, all right, somebody, somebody, somebody's, but something's bugging this writer over here. 
what is it? Let's talk it out. Let's figure it out. And maybe we find out we either convince them that that's we're going this way or they had, or they, we talk it out and think, Oh, you know, it'd be better if we shifted whatever the shift is um, to, to do some, to do something else. You kind of talk about the group processes there, um, which I think is fascinating because in so many elements of life, people talk about something being done by committee, you know, as a pejorative, right? It gets watered down because right. it's being done by committee. So in a show or in shows that you've worked on, which have such like tense scenes that are just like have very clear, direct lines. How do you get to that in a group setting? Yeah. Is, is it hard? I mean. It's for whatever reason, the group, because it's a group of six or seven people pushing towards the same goal. It's not somebody. I think the problem where the problem comes in is who's, somebody who's not part of the process starts throwing in ideas like, Oh, there should be a wormhole or whatever. <laughs> like, wait, you don't understand what led us to get to yeah. this point of this character making decisions. It's like, everybody's sort of rowing in the same direction where I think when things uh, get dis distilled with too many voice, you know, too many voices is when they're not part of the process that got you to the point you're at. Uh, for this particular moment in the story um, where you've really talked about. And it, that's why you have, when we shoot the scenes and have a writer on set and there's an actor reading it and the actor says, why the fuck would I say this? What is this about? Mm. The writer has been there the whole time and says, well, here's the thing. We, your, you know, the character wants this and has been from here and you, you're there to help explain the process of why the characters doing the thing that they're doing and hopefully the actor goes oh yeah and i understand now <laughs> which it's, yeah i mean also in the, in the in the in the room that's also the importance of the showrunner right that like sort of their job is to keep everyone pointed towards yeah. the vision yeah yeah that's a you know a good i've had the benefit of working for showrunners who have very good taste in in ideas and and so vince and peter were able to if the if they felt like the group think was going in a way that was like, eh, you know, I'm not really, what if we steer it back this way? They were very good about steering the conversation into areas that, that really uh, helped tell the best story. Hmm. Um, we, we were talking a little bit about scenes. I think this is an interesting question. It's a little broad, but um, what are the elements of a good scene in your opinion? Are there specific, you know, when you get, when, when the group is all, and I think you could actually say this when you're, writing your own stuff or in, in the group, are there certain things like you're trying to get in the scene um, to make it, you know, really sing? Yeah, that's, I mean, something surprising is always great. Something unexpected is always great. Um, it really depends on the moment in the story. Sometimes you want to give the audience two plus two and let it equals four. And then sometimes you want to like, have it be like, where the hell is this going? So it's different. I mean, as long as the characters are making logical decisions, but can somehow still be surprising. Um, again, if it's surprise, you know, it's the, it's the whole thing of having a character tell themselves, oh, I'm doing it because of this, but then there's some underlying psychological reason um, so that whatever weird thing they do still has to make sense on some level, um, yeah. So you know, see, it's that's a you're right. That's a that's a very big question, a hard question. <laughs> uh, what makes a good scene? It's just uh, you want to. It, it yeah, it really depends. Yeah, I mean, I would also say another aspect would be like you mentioned the characters, right? And like, what do they want? Are they trying to accomplish something in that scene? Are there stakes? What happens if they don't get it? You know, yeah. what happens if they do get it? Why Why are they doing this? Yeah. Are there multiple people with competing interests in the scene? You know, is there conflict there? Yeah. And what you're talking about, you reminds me of something you do is, which is your flow charting. When you're, when you're figuring out where the story is going, you're, you're, we do a lot of flow charting. Like, okay, what's the selfish, selfish reason a character would do this? What if they were being noble? What, I mean, you figure out where the headspace is, but you, and then you sort of pick the most interesting 
thing. And that's how you, when you're flow charting, you get to the surprising moment. Like, oh my God, what if they did this crazy thing? Um, you know, pulled a gun out or, or whatever the thing is that they do that's surprising. You, you sort of, you, you take a, you take a story and you flow chart it. What's, what's all the possible with the, the multiverse? What are the possible things that can happen? And then you follow that line uh, to its conclusion. And is it an interesting, surprising ending? If not, okay, let's go back. What if they made this other choice? Mm-hmm. And, but you want it to be true to the character. So it's like, you can only flow chart so much. As long as it makes, the flow charting makes sense with the character, then great. Interesting. I feel like, you know, Breaking Bad in particular is known for these big moments, right? Like the tent pole things that people talk about. You talked about one with Todd killing the kid, you know, and these things. And and there are certain scenes that just have a gravity to them that almost maybe feel like they don't need a lot of work. They just sort of are interesting. But I think this is an interesting question. What about the scenes in between those? You could call those filler scenes or the slow burn scenes. When you have these scenes where like big things aren't happening how do you still make them interesting or engaging yeah vince always used to quote there's a there's a stanley kubrick quote where it's where you want to have your film be uh filled with uh oh, uh, non-submersible units non-submersible submergible moments with you keep you have these things that you can't forget a head on a tortoise exploding uh whatever it is the thing and sort of place those throughout a season throughout an episode but you can't do that constantly because then it becomes ridiculous. Hmm. Um, so the filler scenes, I mean, the filler scenes have to be funny. They have to be emotional. They have to, you know, find the thing that makes the filler scene interesting. You can't, if you're just doing a filler scene to give the audience information, then something's wrong. You have to find out why, what is, what is the character doing in the scene that makes it interesting it's like, yeah, you want to convey information to the audience, but their car's on fire or whatever, or they're trying to hide something from another character or whatever. What's the, what's the crazy, what's the thing in the scene that makes it engaging to watch? Yeah, I feel like in those scenes, those it's when the character moments are so important where like you really have to be on their journey. Um, and I, I don't know, yeah, sometimes those scenes can be the most heartbreaking in a sense, because it's just the character dealing with themselves or, you know, and not the explosion or the, the, yeah. the exploding head on the tortoise or, you know, something like that, where it's just like reality and yeah. having those character moments. Um, yeah. What do they do when they're alone? And then what do they do when a character walks in the room? How do they change? Uh, what, what are they hiding? What are they lying about? What, do, what don't they want another character to know? And is the, the, and you want your characters to be as smart as possible. So you want to, you know, there's always tension in, oh, this character, like that was another thing in season, when I joined in season three, we, on the, on the board, we put somewhere around episode eight or nine, Skylar figures out that Walt sells meth. Well, that got moved up to episode one, because as we were talking about it, we're like, Skylar is pretty smart. Mm -hmm. And with the evidence she has, she could figure this out. What's good? Hey guys, what would happen if Skyler figured out that Walt is a meth dealer in episode one? And then we, we did that and it changed the direction of the season. So it was like, again, you you have these great things up on the board and yeah, as you space them out, one of the exciting things to do is to say, Oh, that, that big thing we put up in episode nine, what happens if we move it earlier? It really speeds things up and things get, you know, tension gets ratcheted up. So that's, that's a, that's another thing to do when you're breaking your. Yeah. Season. That's such a, a scary and exciting moment where like your end point becomes your starting point And suddenly it's all just virgin territory. You're like, you could go anywhere. Like everything is amped. Yeah. Uh, and, and you're just yeah. sort of like filled with adrenaline. Yeah. I wasn't there for season one, but you know, Tuka Salamanca on Breaking Bad was meant to be. A you know was going to continue on through season two. Well, there was a so you know uh, the the actor was had a, another commitment, <laughs> so they had to kill they had to kill Tuco early in season two. It just made things more you know really. I feel like again I wasn't there for it, but I feel like the writers were really challenged to like what do we do to keep the story 
interesting and it was i mean they did an amazing job so i came into season i came in season three as a fan of everything they had done up to that point and i guess i had a you know fresh it was great to have somebody with fresh eyes which was me in season three and and look at it, what they had done i remember one of my very first pitches was walt finding the the, the eyeball for the bear in the filter of the pool I remember Vince being, oh, that's great. We'll do, you know, it was like, I remember pitching that and having, oh, one of my ideas is stuck. Great. Okay, good. <laughs> Even if I do nothing else for the rest of this, this You season, have one. You have one. Idea, you know, make it into an episode and and and, and uh, sort of carry throughout the, the season. The eyeball became a, a thing throughout the season that Walt kept finding this reminder of this, of this thing he had done that caused this, horrible accident of letting Jane die. It was always this thing watching him and reminding him of what he had done. When you, when you brought up the, the, the Tuco thing, I think that's so fascinating how many creative choices, you know, people are like, why did they do that? Why did they do that? And like, so often the answer is just like a production reality. Like we lost the set or the <laughs> actor wasn't available. I mean, that's why, uh, 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 Saul Goodman exists in the first place. Right. Cause, uh, or no, Mike, that's why Mike oh, exists. First place, Mike Irwin tried this because uh, Bob Odenkirk wasn't Bob Odenkirk available. Committed him for some sitcom or something. He couldn't. He couldn't be there for the shoot of episode two thirteen. So uh, Vincent Company created this detective character, and we again, and he probably exists throughout the Breaking Bad universe because we were very big fans of the show Wise Guy. We loved Jonathan Banks, and once Jonathan Banks was cast. As Mike Ermatrine, it was like, well, we got to use this guy more. He's so cool. We love him. So that, you know, using Mike more in the, uh, in the, in the seasons was just a no brainer. And he became very important because we love the actor. Mm. So a lot of times that'll happen. We love an actor so much, like Patrick Fabian, if we're talking about yeah. Better Call Saul. I remember season four, at the beginning of the season, Chuck McGill dies at the end of season three. And we were like, well, do we, God, what do we do with Patrick Fabian? Do we do we put him on, put him in the cast again? Because what's he going to do? Chuck is dead, and th we love Patrick so much that we we wreck, like how do we keep Howard Hamlin involved in the show? And it really had us focus on the character, and he became integral to everything. Patrick's uh, Howard Hamlin's character became integral to what happened mm -hmm. into turning Jimmy into Saul Goodman. Yeah, Patrick, fantastic uh, actor and also an ace pickler. Remember, he he was he would he brought he made pickles and like brought them to the to the writers room. Jars and jars of pickles for everyone. Yeah, I had some like I have Patrick Fabian jar of pickles, uh, which was a great. Just like this is a great TV Hollywood moment uh, that you don't Next expect. The what can we say? Hey, it's great. I love it. Um, throughout this process, how is research being integrated? Because you know. The writers aren't lesser lawyers or meth, you know, uh, dealers, as, as far as I know. Um, so what's the process of getting the research integrated into it? Yeah, I mean, Saul was ridiculous in the fact that we did not have a single lawyer on the staff. We relied in retrospect, on... maybe, maybe, maybe one. We relied on the sister of one of our writers who was a lawyer. We call her up and ask her advice. But in the season one, we actually... Uh, through various contacts, uh, people Vince knew, people Peter knew, Peter knew. We'd have we had like three or four lawyers come to our offices and just talk to us and talk about different things. What it was like to be a lawyer? What are some crazy things that you saw? Stuff like that, just to get us into that. When we actually took a field trip down to the uh, the courthouse. The courthouse. Oh my gosh, I remember that. Yeah, and we went down and just in groups. We just went and. You're able, you're able to just go and just sit in on other people's trials. And, and so we did that for like a day where we just- I remember, were you in the um, the courtroom uh, I was in where there was the, the roommate who was being bullied and the roommate had the other, or the landlady had thrown a, um, or like she threw a cup of urine on to the landlady and the, and the lawyer said the line, like, ladies and gentlemen, this case isn't about urine or something like that. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, I don't but that I remember being taught that being talked about because we broke up into different groups. Yeah, and went to cases, and I remember I wasn't there for that one, but I remember it being talked yeah. about.
uh i yeah i think about sometimes i feel like i should just go down there like i mean there's so many it's a lot of tragic stories like i mean that's a funny line but it's actually very sad uh yeah. that's bad laughing a little bit um but like i don't know there's so much like which is crazy by the way you like you can just go to the courts and just like sit in on trials yeah. if you sit want there and just take notes and yeah. just just so yeah so whatever you're whatever you're writing about if you have yeah. To, yeah to speak to the people in that profession or just go and observe then go do it just sort of get a feel and we like i i still have a notebook where i took like sketches mm. of what was happening in the courtroom and these weird signs with tape it was just you know you expect the law to be more <laughs> it was just run down and just weird. yeah so we, that really helped inform episode one where it was what we termed boredom in the court where like nothing was happening they were all sitting around waiting for saul for jimmy and mcgill to show up because that's something we experienced we sat there and it was just we sit, we sit there and the lawyer, the judge would just be on the, on the stand going through papers and this would go on for like five minutes and nobody talking and nothing happening. It was just, so it was like, oh, we got, how do we, we want to show what it's really like <laughs> to be in, in a courtroom. Yeah. I also remember times, um, cause you know, uh, assistants do a lot of research of the, like some of the things that like, cause my desk was right outside the writer's room, just being like, Micah, how do you break into a car? or something like that. And I'll just be like, uh, yeah. I don't know. I'm going to do research on that for a while. And then like walking into the room, be like, all right, this is what I found. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's really hard to break into like these kind of cars these days with this technology, blah, blah, blah. You, you would need to be an older car if they're doing this, you know, like, et cetera. Yeah, uh, always uh, very, you know, always throw things to the writer's assistants to help us figure out like what's something that could explode that, that that's that big and, you know, would explode on impact or, yeah, it's all kinds of crazy things. Like sometimes you just, you know, what's uh, you scam? I think you put came up with a lot of scams, right? Too was that some of your research? Oh, I did that. I forgot about that. Yeah, I was like, yeah, so, looking at like cons. Jimmy, yeah, yeah. Jimmy was a was a you know, and his and his buddy Marco would scam people. Like, what's some great bar scams? I think that was thrown to you. Like, what's some things you do? Yeah. And I remember you coming back with a list of of research about oh, here's people get scammed doing this and that. And, we we did try to incorporate that into, or even I think one of the time we're like we just need a lawyer joke with some good lawyer jokes and I, uh, you know we get a list of lawyer jokes because we want Jimmy or somebody to tell it tell it yeah. you know a joke about I his think, own. Yeah, that's interesting. Just just like plug kind of what writer assistants do. Like it was a really great experience working on 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 Better Call Saul. Like my favorite thing that I got to do was um, write casting scenes. So like when uh, you're casting a part, um, you send out a scene to uh, the, the casting people and you don't really want necessarily spoilers to be in that. So I would take, and uh, the other, the writer assistant did a lot of these and then I started doing it, Heather did them and then I started doing them too. You'd sort of take an existing scene and like rewrite it in a new context. Um, and this was, I remember being like an assistant and writing these scenes. And then you mentioned seeing the casting uh, tapes auditions at the very beginning. Uh, when the fan was going. Um, and I remember like I wrote these scenes and then we started watching the casting, uh, the the audition tapes. And I'm just sitting there being like, the Breaking Bad writers are sitting around watching a scene I wrote right now. <laughs> like, you know, like this is, and sometimes there'd be like five bad auditions in a row. And I'd be like sitting out the room, just like covering my head being like, I botched this totally. And then like, the sixth person would be great. I'd be like, okay, maybe, maybe I didn't just completely yeah. like destroy it. That's myself. that's the worst sometimes when you're watching something that you've written and it's just not being interpreted in a way that you wish it could be. And then yeah. then you can so and it's so just this weird thing that it's not that they're bad actors, it's just that you need the things that fit in a certain way and they, whatever it is that some people just have an instinct for a certain thing you're going for more than others, and whatever. And you know. Uh, an actor who does quote unquote bad in, in one audition will kill it in another. And we, we were always very good about, you know, seeing an actor and being like, okay, they're not quite right for this. They're not getting this, but let's remember them. We'll flag them for a future thing. And we always, you know, and some actors would come, would audition multiple times for different roles. And they just, for whatever reason, they just kind of get edged out by somebody else. But we, uh, they'd always come back and we, you know, eventually use a lot of people mm -hmm. who, who auditioned multiple times. 
Um, before we get to some more questions, I want to just like finish through the process. So once the episode is fully carded and we end up with, you know, this that we saw earlier, how do we go from this to, to script? Like if say it's your episode. Yeah. So for, for Saul and for Breaking Bad, we'd, uh, in order to keep AMC and Sony in the loop about what was going on, um, we do an outline, uh, like a 10 page outline based on those cards. And it, I always found it kind of annoying because it was just like, it's just a different writing an outline is a different, it's just a different form of writing. It's like, you're making it descriptive in a way that doesn't really help your screenplay. <laughs> you're yeah. like, you want to make this, you want to make this document entertaining and tell a story, but you're telling a short story as opposed to writing a screenplay. So it was just like, you're doing like, you're doing not quite twice the work because you'd figure out some dialogue and some, some things would get worked out in the outline, but it was just like, here's this document for the studio network and you'd wait to hear thumbs up or we're confused by this or that. And do we have, are there questions that we need to answer and help, you know, maybe there, cause sometimes there'd be things that we as the writers group were not seeing was a problem, but then when a fresh eyes were reading it, if somebody, if they were confused by something, we think, okay, there's a, there's an issue here. We need to help explain or, or whatever we, we try to fix it. And then, after the outline was written, then we, <clears throat> our writer's assistants would take all those cards, Xerox them onto <clears throat> pages so that when the writer was writing it, they could cross off the scenes, the cards that they've written and just flip through and, and do all the scenes and, and just write a screenplay based on what you have there. Hmm. So, so how much... When you are actually writing the script, I mean, the the episodes are broken in such detail. Do you feel, do you ever feel limited at all in what you can do in the script? Or do you still have freedom to interpret, to to add a little of your own yeah, self to it? Because as you're writing the screenplay, things emerge that you didn't, because you can't think of everything when you're breaking it. And as you're writing it, and figuring out where characters are standing in the scene and how one scene transitions into the other. Um, and you're not, you're not coming up with all the dialogue when you're breaking uh, the scene. Um, so a lot of original fun dialogue will come out as you're writing it. So yes, yeah, th new things emerge as you're crafting the screenplay. And if something radical comes to your mind, then you bring it back to the room saying, I'm thinking of this as opposed to what we talked about. And then, you talk about that and either run with it or if, if there's a problem, then you say, oh, no, we stick with what we broke. And... When you're um, when you're writing your own scripts, um, not with the writer's room, do you use the same approach? Are you getting out cards and putting up a board or is it different? I, I actually just finished a spec script where I did not use any cards or outlines or anything. I just kind of went, had an idea from the beginning and just kind of built from that and which was a new thing it was kind of going back to way the way i wrote the very first screenplay i had option where i started at a scene in the beginning and just built from that and kind of had a rough idea where it was going but things changed and it actually the, the spec script ended up in a different place than i thought it would so um you know and we'll see maybe this spec script will never see the light of day or maybe you I can come back on some day and say, remember that thing I talked about? Well, here it was actually got made and we did it. Um, so we'll see what happens with it. But uh, um, I tend to try to do, uh, whenever I do a project, do cards. But, uh, you know, I changed it up with his last <laughs> spec script I did. But this, this, this script I did before that was all fully carded on a board I have at home. When you... Um... So you mentioned earlier that uh, uh, Gen V, you guys use whiteboards. When you're on another show that doesn't use the sort of the the the, the carding system, that's maybe a little looser. Does that feel? Is it more difficult? Do you do you like it? Is it is it a change of pace that you like, or or how do you how do you feel? I, about I it? usually I'm grumpy. I hate it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to do the card. I I think early on in the season I tried to force cards on everybody, but I. You know, it's like when you have everybody, it's kind of got to have to go with the flow. It's not my show. I'm helping uh, 
another showrunner, Michelle Fazekas, and she's we use a whiteboard, so we're using using the whiteboards. But what I find because we're we're breaking we're like an episode five right now, and you don't have those boards up around the room because when we did Saul and Breaking Bad, we'd have four episodes up at a time. So you you break episode one through four, all those cards would be up, and then when you start episode five, you take episode one down. And start, so you're just kind of going around the room and putting up the episodes with the whiteboards. You're just sort of doing one episode at, at a time, and everything gets erased. And then you're like, Where the who, where was that character? What happened? It's my memory isn't so good, so I was I'm having trouble sort of remembering what came before, and especially then when we get um, studio notes and uh, you know, uh, producer notes, then things change even more. It's very hard to keep track of. What the fuck is happening? <laughs> uh, I have this I'm, idea. I'm, in my, no. I have this idea in my head right now that, like, if you turned your computer around, you'd have all these cards in your office that, like, you've secretly been carding the whole season. <laughs> and you're just like, they can't stop me. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to see what happens when we get to the episode I'm writing. <laughs> I might insist on cards, but we'll we'll see what happens. I'm writing episode seven, so we'll. Uh, we'll see. We're doing five now. We'll see what happens when we get there. Awesome. All right. So we've got Tom. I think you can stick around for another 10, 15 minutes. Is that yeah. about right? Yeah. Um, all right. So we got a bunch of comments here. Um, let's just kind of, and we're going to get through and, and, and do as many of these um, as, as we can before uh, Tom has to go. Um, I think this is interesting. How do you, how best to judge the type of format uh, or how did, how to judge, how, how best to judge the type of format best suited to the story? Uh, how does writing long episodic compare to writing a miniseries? So in general, like when you have an idea, how do you know, or do you know at the start whether it is going to be, you know, a specific, uh, a, a movie, a miniseries, an ongoing series? Um, I don't know if you ever really know. It's sort of a leap of faith. You sort of have to think about it and and figure out how, you know, is there enough story to go, um, forwards or for a season or more on this thing, or sometimes it's a very clear ending and you might only have <clears throat> four episodes of story or you just, it's just a gut thing. I think you just have to look at what you have and, and sort of let your mind wander into the future. And like, do I imagine this going for, for five seasons or use and, and you never really know. You just have to sort of make that leap of faith that, that, Yes, I can tell multiple stories with this, or sometimes you're just more realistic and think, you know, this is my character is doing this horrible thing, and there's no way they're going to survive past episode eight, and maybe this is just going to end here. So you just sort of have to go with your gut and, and mm -hmm. figure out how much story you have in you for a particular idea, plot line, whatever it is. Cool. Um... What's the best writing routine schedule in order to significantly improve in the craft? Um, I imagine, I mean, this is sort of different. Every writer has their sort of their own schedule. What is your writing routine? Yeah, I was historically a nighttime writer. I would like wait until like 11 o'clock at night and then just write for several hours in the middle of the night. It was almost, almost all of my stories. Then I had children. And then, now I'm trying to write whatever the hell I can. Um, and it's very, you know, finding the writing time is, is very uh, hard sometimes. So now, now it's just, um, it's really whenever you can, for me right now, it's like whenever I can make the time, I just sit down and just kind of focus for, and um, because the kids come first, you, they have, <laughs> they have lots of activities that you need to go to or attend and, and help them with their homework. And it's, um, so even now, I mean, yet yeah, I think for the last couple of things I've done, once they've gone to bed, then I will stay up, but I just don't, I don't have the stamina I used to anymore. I, I uh, was just writing something for the show last week and I was sort of make it to about midnight and I would fall asleep at my desk or in front of the computer. <laughs> and it's like, I, whereas in the past, I used to be able to like to stay up until three o'clock in the morning and just, you know, focus without any phone calls or any other interruption and just put some music on and just write. So, um, so 
but for most of my life, it would be, I would be at like a nighttime uh, writer and just mm-hmm. sort of, you, you just sort of know, oh, nobody's going to bother me. Everybody else is asleep. I can just do my thing and just sit there for several hours and just kind of be in your, in your writing world and focus on the thing you're doing. I found that kind of the opposite. I've, I've started doing a little early morning writing because I just tend to wake up and yeah. I've just, I've started keeping my laptop just like next to the bed and I'll just write and it's, it'll be yeah. dark sometimes. And it's the same thing. If the world can't bother you yet, it's, it's fantastic. It's just whatever uh, your personality is. And some people like yeah. to be writing in public. I, I could never fucking do that. I'd be too distracted all the time by what's going on around. I, I couldn't write in a coffee shop, but some love- people... I was writing at a coffee shop this morning. Um, <laughs> all right, this is a good question. What should happen in act one? What makes people want to turn the next page? I think there's actually two great questions here. Um, but yeah, what? let's take the first one. What should happen in, in act one? Yeah, I mean, you want to sort of set the direction for where the story is going and just figure out where your character is in the beginning and what the goal is and how, you know, what's the direction, what's the hurdle they're going to overcome to get to the next step. So I think mm-hmm. that's really what you want to, and you, and again, it's to get people to turn the page. You want something to surprising happen to happen pretty early on. Like what's what's an early twist or what's an early surprise that happens? Yeah, I'd also that your audience hopefully doesn't see coming. Yeah, I'd also throw in for Act One establishing the tone of the show. Like, what is this? Um, you know, if you're writing a comedy. Just like, you, are people laughing on the first page? If you know if they're not, then yeah, that's probably gonna be issue. If you know your 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 user is shriek queen, so I'm guessing you're writing in the horror space, and like <laughs> tone is such an important aspect of that. Like, what is the feel of this movie? Am I yeah. scared? Even if something necessarily scary is even looks like it happening. Um, yeah, on, yeah. On the set set the mood, especially with the screenplay. Set the set the mood about you know within the first five pages you should be able to understand what this what you're getting into without Mm. you know without it being predictable another great craft question how do you guys make such crispy act breaks that really was a carryover from the x-files it was very in the carding process when you finished an act you really wanted it to end and build to something really interesting and so because you wanted people not to stick around through the commercials and this is back in the days when you couldn't fast forward yeah. to the commercials you were forced to wait <laughs> you had to you had to wait through the commercials and come back and see what was going to happen so you really wanted to end your act on a twist a surprise um as much as possible and that really a lot of times when we we're breaking stories we get to the you know sort of get a feel of all right, we're at our, our at our end of our act, but this is not really surprising. So we'd move a scene to the beginning of Act Two and try to think what's the best way to to, to hook, hook people into coming back. If let's pretend that they have to watch the commercials, what what do we <laughs> what do we do to make them stick around? I think that's fascinating because you know even. Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, they were on AMC, which is basic cable. So they did have commercial breaks, whereas now in streaming and uh, premium cable the whole time, there haven't been commercial breaks. So are you still like Gen V, right? This is on Amazon. Um, You're streaming. Are you still thinking in terms of acts? Not as much. I when I first got here, I it was because they they've already been through season one. And they have their their sort of method. And because when I first got here, I was like, "Oh, do we are we breaking this up into acts so that we know?" Um, we don't do that as much. They do what they do here is uh, talk a lot about character arcs, and they will break down sort of a where where does the character start, and what's the emotional arc for every character in the episode. And they there's a lot of talk about what that is, and then then there's figuring out how do that how do those interweave with each other. Um, so it's a different form, different way to tell a story. Um, I'm sort of getting used to it. Uh, even a couple of couple of months in, I'm still figuring it out because it's just it's just a different way of working. Um, uh, if it was my show, I don't think I would. I think I would go back to the more traditional uh, Breaking Bad way, and I would think in terms. If it was my show, I would think more in terms of 
of what the act break would be and, and building to a moment and then coming to the head of act two and figuring out, okay, the characters are figuring out how to get out of this predicament we left them in at the end of act one, two, or three. Mm. A couple more questions I think we have time for. Um, how do you write characters that you don't have any similarities to? Um, especially, you know, yeah, they mentioned Tuco. How do you make a character like Tuco's actions believable if, you, if you've never met a Tuco? Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, something I did in college was take acting classes. And it's really, I mean, as a writer, you should have, even if you can't act, the knowledge of what it is for to be an actor in a scene and think about, you know, the character story. And it's really getting into a headspace of being a character. And I think, I think taking, if, if you're a writer starting out, try to take some acting classes and understand how to break down a scene from an actor's perspective and figure out where the peaks and valley, because that was something that I did in acting classes. So you, you take a scene like we did, uh, another student and I did a scene from the producers and I'm the Gene Wilder character. And you figure out what's the, the peaks and the valleys and, 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 you know, sort of, you know, graphing it out and where the highs and lows are, and where the transitions are. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, from an acting standpoint, you're, none, none of your actors are actually who their characters are, but they have to come mm -hmm. up with a history and think, okay, if I'm this person, how do I act? How do I react? It's all that, you know, it's basically acting and then translating it to the page. Cool. Um, Speaking of kind of character, what are some ways to increase the complexity of protagonists to make them interesting to follow through many episodes? So I feel like sometimes you have a character, maybe the difference between a minor character and a, and a major character is, yeah, the ability to, to want to watch them through seasons, through multiple seasons. How do you develop characters that are complex enough to follow them through multiple seasons? Yeah, I think that's just going back to what we talked about earlier as far as what the characters are telling themselves and what the real psychological underline and really understanding understand the psychology of your character and really figure out what's that lie they tell themselves that makes it okay for them to to murder this person or to cheat on their wife or or you know stay out late and not be there for their kids or whatever what's the thing that that's that they're telling themselves that makes it okay for them to do the, the horrible things they're doing and i think the more you can do that and think about all the things that we tell ourselves to get through the day <laughs> and, and, and she, you know, whatever, whatever pain is happening in our lives, what are the, the things that we're doing to cover that up? It's really building all the stuff on top of each other to, to make the character sort of rich. And, you know, what's the lie they're telling this person that because uh, they're not successful in their career, but uh, they want to pretend that, Oh, I'm writing a book about blah blah blah, but they're they're really not doing any of that. They're they're they have a gambling problem. Whatever 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 it is in your story, what's figure out the lies, the real psychological underpinning of what why they do the things that they do, and hopefully you get a really complex character off of that. Awesome. All right, I'm gonna do one final question. I feel like it's kind of obligatory when you're talking with an artist. Uh, what are your influences? Are there any pieces of media that you would say have greatly influenced you? Uh, I mean, it that'll change daily. I, I mean, I will come up with so many different answers. The thing that really uh, probably got me wanting to be in television was the show SCTV because it, they were so, it's like you have, I, it's like when I really first started looking at the credits of a TV show, like, oh, the actors are writing their own stuff and they're really into making fun of television and really having this sharp take on it was like just so it's like man i wanted to, it was like something i wanted to be a part of um so that's one thing i mean so many so many things in in so many great movies in history one flew over the cuckoo's nest is is my favorite film and it's really something that i when i watched it really had an influence on me and really if i, I could point to that movie and, and point to scenes and and saw and say oh i ripped that off from from that and just the, you know just this, this scene at the end of the movie when Jack Nicholson is just sitting there and the camera's on his face for like, I don't even know how long. It's just him going through all these thoughts and he doesn't say anything. 
And I took that and put that in episode 201 when we're Jimmy sitting in a raft in a pool. I was like, Bob, just don't say anything. Just think about this and this and this. And he goes through and he just, and he, before he decides to call up uh, Davis and Maine and take the job that he's going to take, it's just uh, so, I mean, that, that would, Cuckoo's Nest is an influence. Uh, the Marx Brothers, all the crazy writings of, uh, of uh, S.J. Perlman and all that, all the stuff that, that led to making the Marx Brothers as crazy as they are. That, I mean, there's probably, I can probably sit here for 30 minutes and just talk about different yeah. things. I mean, I love like how many comedy things for a drama writer, like how many, I mean, I think that, that's one of the, my favorite things about, I think those shows, you know, Breaking Bad, Berker Saul is how funny they were. And I think a lot of shows get that wrong. If they try to do a, something in the style of Breaking Bad, they forget about the humor. Um, yeah. Don't take I, yourself, don't take yourself too seriously and really find like dark. I've always loved dark humor. Um, and so any, any kind of dark, anything that's, dark and twisted, but it can still make you laugh. I, I love. Yeah. All right. Well, Tom, I know you got to get home, put your kids to bed. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone. We got still so many people here stuck uh, through to the end. Thank you all for your questions. Sorry, I was not able to get through everyone's questions, but I hope you, I mean, there's so much great stuff from Tom here. Uh, Tom, do you want to leave any parting words of wisdom uh, to our audience? <laughs> oh God, just the, the regular trope, you know, don't give up. Just yeah, you know, really. I mean, if if you have a passion for writing, you will find a way to to get it done. I mean, if just keep writing. I mean, I you would stay up so late at night before I actually optioned my first screenplay. It was like you just keep writing and writing and writing until the thing. And it's a it's a it's a crapshoot crapshoot. There's a lot of luck involved. It's if you keep writing, it's just getting that thing you love to the person who can actually get it made. It's like a lot of things have to happen, but as long as you keep throwing those darts at the wall and hopefully one of them sticks, uh, if you're passionate enough, you don't give up, you keep trying. And so if you really want to write, if you're a writer who has not been uh, published yet or has not had a, anything made, keep doing it. Awesome. I think that's a great note to end on. Uh, Tom, stick around for a moment, but everyone else, have a fantastic evening and I'll catch you uh, 